Greetings, everybody around the land. Uh, I want to say how much I respect you as people, people who want to hear, want to grow, want to do the right thing. I'm also going to talk about the differences between viewpoints of people who teach on the word office, profit, and ministry. And I have a new look, a new day, a new vision, fine-tuned. And so we're going to submit this as Sela for you on behalf of leadership, a future church, what's online and what's on land. So I'm going to teach on the office of a prophet with no agenda, just trying to be pure, trying to sort things out, submitting scriptures because of what goes on in the land, all the name calling, all the accusation, all the reviling, and then all the people of all ages, junior on up, calling everybody else, prophesying doom and death to famous people and not, and that's just outrageous. My Bible tells me that there are differences between the Old Testament display of the office prophet, a real prophet, and a new one, a New Testament display. And we want to teach the scriptures, foundational teaching. Okay, so as you might have known, years ago the Lord started to send me to study the body of Christ. He told me when I was 24, by His grace, to study their doctrine, their pet peeves, their red flag buzzwords, their music, and their style. It would be men and women, all colors, speaking in tongues or not. And that one day, which is now, I'd build bridges of understanding for the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. All right. So we're here today with a few puzzlements of why people don't know this. Why don't they know more about the true Lord, Jesus Christ, and the movement of the Holy Spirit? Hebrews 10.29, yes, they know Hebrews 10.25, I mean about church, but do they know about the difference between the Old Testament prophet and a new one? And we can give you ideas, counsel, whatever you need about that, because people don't, you know, this is our, our turn to say it. So back in the day when I was coming up and the different movements started before TV, during TV, and now big, I remember when the 90s came, I'd studied more pos you know, positive groups, and it was more the word, wonder working, standing on the word, claiming, that type of thing, and I'd been denominational, they're all kinds. And so then the, the times change, and I noticed, you know, it was after the TV media scandals and after the famous TV, people started to put it like that, you know, started getting big and promoted in media. And so I'm out in the grassroots on purpose, a missionary type, just being led of the Lord, no secret agenda except to study, to know the Lord, have my own life. So I'd hear different occasional teachings of the word prophecy, because that move came in in the 90s. I first started to, any, you know, study it in 91. And what I found out I loved was worship, the good worship. You really need it. Sometimes you're oppressed and, you know, really good. So there's the word in the worship Jesus said for everybody's knowledge. In Matthew 22, 29, he told the Sadducees who didn't believe in the supernatural power of God. He said, you err, brethren, you err, not knowing the scriptures and the power of God. So this is a lesson to know both, more of both. Okay. So as I was led to the Holy Spirit realm where they started to teach prophecy, I noticed that back in the day they had books by people that were now that are now famous. They were teaching the people how what a prophet is and all that. Well, in my opinion, I don't think I have to know all that. I feel like I was supposed to know the Bible and the Lord Jesus and then learn about different things. But I feel like the main need now is really to go back and say who is really Jesus? What is ministry instead of all this all that? Just making a niche only basically about that. So I was listening and somebody that wrote is now famous wrote books at the beginning. I remember hearing them being taught to the people. And it said, you know, you gotta make allowances. You just gotta give them grace because those prophets are moody. They could act grumpy, distant, unfriendly, but you gotta you know, that's just a prophet. And I saw it, no. Something didn't wash. That is a pass for people. From what happened later, yes. You got to train people differently, and let's tell you this way: people have different personas, personalities, ways of thinking, demeanors. All right, some are more stern, some are not. But we want to know a couple of things, a lot of things. 
All right, if you look at the Old Testament prophet, they were coming up under the law, the Torah time, Old Testament, and it says, this is our verse, our scriptures are Hebrews 1 and 2 and 9, to help you start discerning. Hebrews 1, 2, and 9, it says, In the old days, Old Testament, God spoke to his people through diverse manners with the prophets. And those prophets were more finger pointy, I guess more grouchy looking, you know, more crude, or, you know, they were not as modern as now. But they were doing the business of God, and the issue was only a few people could hear God. Only a few people back then could allow to be hear God to get a word to give to the people, to the king, or warn people. And they were more warning people of judgment and Nineveh and all these things. All right. They had diverse manners. How did they speak? Well, they lay on their side naked, let's say, for 300, I think it was Ezekiel. They had firm words. They had um, words that warned and all these things. I'm not saying you can't do that now. But I'm saying we've got to teach the balance of what's next. All right. So there is no emotional abuse in prophecy, no rudeness in prophecy. There is no, there is humility in prophecy. All right, you can have a greatness, but it's not about the person or their skill. That's what it is now. It's not about their fame, it's about their heart. And are they seeing the heart of the Lord and the word of the Lord? That's what we're working on. So in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the old days, Old Testament, God spoke in diverse manners through his prophets, a few people. But in these days, Hebrews 1 and 2, God speaks to us through his son, Jesus the Messiah. That implies to me that we need to study Jesus in his relationships, his respect with his mother, with the people, how he acted and reacted. And then we act the same. And then we can find out that Jesus Christ, also in Hebrews 1.9, had joy. He had childlike joy. It says, Jesus Christ was anointed with the oil of joy and gladness above his fellows, because he hated iniquity, what the sin fallen human condition did to people. But he didn't hate the sinner or the people. It said, and he loved what was righteous. That means he loved the freedom of peace and rest and kindness and responsibility and nobody tr being a traitor, hurting anybody. Love, righteousness, innocence. Okay, But he wasn't squeaky clean, superior, you know, holier than thou, self-righteous. No. And he related. Acts 10.38 says, Jesus Christ wasn't just hiding in his cave in the anointing like some do. It says, Jesus Christ, Acts 10, 38, went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. And the Lord was with him. The Lord accompanied him in the Holy Spirit anointing, approved and endorsed of his ministry, so to speak. Jesus Christ, led by the Father, went about doing good, healing, not hurting, not accusing, not harming. He went about doing good, healing all those who are oppressed by the devil. Who oppresses? Not Jesus. Who depresses, oppresses, suppresses, makes fun of? Lambast, not Jesus. All right. So Jesus Christ is our role model, the Messiah. And all you do is study more about Jesus, you know. So he went about doing good, healing, not harming, not word cursing, not betraying, not being holier than thou, I'm reading you from far away and then I'll word curse you and you know, you're gonna die. Hey, check that out. So we go back for a little bit of a reminder, a mantra. You know, mantra is not even a Christian word, but we're using it because it's big. You know, we understand what it means. A repeated credo. <laughs> and um, it said, all right, Jesus Christ went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil and the Lord was with him. But we want to go back for our credo here, our ministry training to start again, is you get your Bible out and you read when Christ was alive in ministry, walking the earth from age sweet baby Jesus on up to 33, and you read every one of his relationships mentioned in the Bible. 
how he acted and how he reacted and we act like him with his mother Mary with the people with the uh, children with the demoniac with the men the fallen people all these people and you just do the same so that's John, Matthew Mark Luke and John the good news it was called the good news I'd like to point out right now when Jesus Christ came up to the Jewish people and then to the Gentiles he was not wanted by the system it was not the common people of the Jews it was the system that owned the money the temple system like now so we can see a lot of things that maybe the temple thought you know we're gonna be the prophet or you know people take this so seriously because of training because of the attitudes in their movement and we got to have where's Jesus you know so the word of the Lord is a if you have a call to give a word of the Lord that would mean you're a prophet but it means you want to be hearing God and be accurate but if you have a call to be the office you got to know more about Jesus than anybody in ministry so we go back to Matthew Mark Luke and John how did Jesus act how did Jesus react and it'll transform our lives and our nation it will so I go back to the day when you know before all this I didn't know the law the old time Torah law and its governing authority is now used in the I would call Bible thumpers it is now used in the harlot watchers it is now used in the Pharisees of now watching everybody and say you're out of order you're in submitted I never speak to you I don't really care about you I just want to know if you're in order like I say that is the tone of old timey law it is and let me say this in the Christ we want to know that he would resemble his father in relationship respect and honor he would be like daddy creator God when Adam sinned you know firstborn Adam sinned and Eve had sinned first technically she was deceived but God had appointed had told Adam in Genesis 1 and 2 don't eat of that tree before he was formed so when Adam sinned willfully he didn't get deceived he willfully participated took it from Eve's hand and the Bible says Adam pleased his wife rather than pleasing God whom he had his first primary relationship with here's what's cool about Christ resembling his father the Heavenly Father all right Adam has just wrecked the firstborn son man had just wrecked God's plan forevermore no sin you know no Torah law was needed everybody get along and he chose to please himself and his wife and he ate what was forbidden well God has the right every right as a parent as the creator as the omnipotent eternal God to come over and really smite him <laughs> lambast him cream him berate him <laughs> smite him on the spot this is the teaching point look at how God comes over he knows Adam is sin God is everywhere so he knows but he comes over to Adam to hold him accountable respectfully not Eve and he says to Adam his firstborn Adam where are you oh like a dad a great dad went you know giving Adam a little chance to fess up man up and human up that would be Christ as well because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the triune God. All right, so this is a relationship lesson. When I go through the many things that take to teach this fully, I can't. But I can say this is why the this is why the um, accuser is there because once they chose to follow the wrong person, the wrong entity, they started to resemble it and lost the human power of self-control, self-governing. Along with that comes blame shifting. Adam said, oh, God said, where are you? He says, well, you know, the woman, the woman that you gave me, she made me do it. So the woman has been getting it ever since with LP, not all, but LP. All right. We're going to train it. We're going to train it. Theology. All right. So it's relationship respect. What happened was the power of self-government and over our tongue, accusation, the power over us, so you know being respectful to somebody else caring more about them than us started to go down that's why eventually it got so big and so much murder and attack God had to put the law a schoolmaster from the outside in now within the law even though there are rules Ten Commandments 
sacrifices, things, you better not do it or you're going to get a penalty. That's the law for them. And we're not negating, we're thinking that was what God needed. He did it as a mystery. Yes, we're for it. But we can't use the law in New Testament days when Jesus Christ, our Savior, has fulfilled the law for us and given his body and blood, shed blood as a sacrifice, that he takes all the accusation and the power, he gives us the power back over our self-government to have discipline and self-control even under pressure. I'm working on it. We can all work on it. So we also don't forget there's another apostle that's not mentioned often that Jesus Christ left in, in, you know, in the Bible, in Revelation. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did. And that would be John the Revelator in John 12, 7 through 13. It tells why Jesus came, the prophet, what he did when he rose again, and that he gave back and handed back the power that was lost in the garden in Genesis 3. He gave it back over to the church. And it said a prophecy which we have not seen yet. And it's getting pretty late, everybody. It said there was a prophecy. John the apostle on the Isle of Patmos who almost died because they boiled him in oil. Right. It said that John saw the church. Revelation 7 through 11, verse 11. Revelation 7, I mean 12, 7 through 11, 11. It said, John saw they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto death. Whoa, who is that? Who's them? Us. Should we care to be taught about it? Should we train in it? Should we do it? They, John saw in the prophetic realm, they saw them, us, overcome him. Who's him? The accuser, the liar, the deceiver, the adversary, all the, by the power of the strength of the Holy Spirit and the weapons of our warfare in being taught, trained, and doing it. It also said they overcame him, and I can't teach it, it's too big. They overcame him, the accuser, the gossip, the liar, the abuser, the word cursor, which is first rate, second rate, you know, nature, really, to humankind. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto death. They were sacrificial and resisted wanting to punch somebody out, wanting to accuse people. They resisted it because they were human, but they needed God because they had a fear, a wonder about the holy fear of the Lord, a conviction that they're living their life for somebody else, not themselves. All right. So they overcame him. That's a teaching. By the blood of the Lamb, got to tell why the blood, how the blood, what is the blood of the Lamb teaching, and the word of their testimony, and they love not their life under death. That means with as a parent, a step parent, a teacher, a false prophet, you got to decide what to do with your words and your tone. Then you can say also, when that that's about us doing stuff, accusing or not, all right, blaming or not. God is watching. All right, so it also says what happens when we get accused, when we get falsely accused, abused, relied. It overcame him, the adversary, by forgiveness and repentance and getting strong to do it. it takes a long time and a big lesson. I can't teach it all. All right, so we see that as a portrait, a growing giant portrait of a prophet Christ doing all that. You know, he's not just in one section of the book. He's everywhere. And in John, excuse me, in Revelation, I think it's 19 10, it says the spirit, the testimony of Jesus, the words of Jesus, his testimony, is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of, let's see, the, the, the um, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, I'm going to read about the spirit of prophecy and the testimony of Jesus by his character, by his fruit, by his persistence. By his overcoming, and I got to read again Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, see how he talked and reacted, even when he was put upon with every kind of person, male and female, all right? So this is a teaching, kernel teaching for somebody, all right? So I look also that um, there's more than just him dying and giving it back. There's so much more I can't get into it. But I want to look back at a portrait of the prophet Messiah 
of the New Testament, Hebrews 1-2, but I want to see when he was foretold in the Old Testament. A couple of different portraits. One would be Isaiah 11, 2 and 8, 11, excuse me, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. It said that the Messiah, the foretold Christ, the foretold prophet would come with all of God's seven eternal spirits, wonder-working power spirits in him, which would be the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of counsel, might, fear of the Lord, wisdom and understanding and so forth. And those would be something we could ask to emulate, ask God for more of it. And we could note that as we teach it. But then we could also say, with all that power, all that might, all the supernatural, eternal God that nobody knew a mystery, there was no giant ego. There was no need to be bowed and worshipped to, catered to. There was no denominational uh, us against them. He, he was for the Savior for all of us. So in verse, excuse me, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, this is a character word. This is a quality fruit word for the Christian church, for the charismatic, right? With all the power and might in the Lord, Jesus Christ going about doing good in Acts 10, 38 in the New Testament, it said that Jesus Christ delighted himself, Isaiah 11, 3, he delighted himself in the fear of the Lord, and he would not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor make decisions based on what he heard. So he could be filled with all this power, wonder-working power, but he could also be unusual. And he would be filled, but he had humility. He would not accuse or judge. He would not find fault judge, far off spy with his prophetic gift and seerish qualities. He wasn't that kind of person. So he would not accuse or judge, he would assess, evaluate, and I'm pretty sure that he would, like the father, confront, like God did to Adam, a relationship respect thing. Let me point out before I miss this, that in Isaiah, there is a word of the Lord to the leaders of God's people. It's a very big word. The ten chapters of Isaiah is a giant word for now. And God's people. All right. But I want to point out that when you have Jesus Christ being foretold in Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, it's after this. So there's a need for more, you know. But I also want to point out that in the book of Isaiah, it is a huge word. I really feel a call. I've been trying to get to it. I haven't called the Nation of Isaiah series, different snapshots. This is part of it. So when you look at Isaiah 1, 18, where it's talking about the sins of God's people that were causing trouble to the whole nation, making them woe, dull of discerning, calling good evil, evil good, blocking the power of God in ministry in the, uh, the nation. It said in Isaiah 10, 27, you're making all God's leaders, who had little g gods, chapters 1 through 3, uh, little g gods, false religion, and vanity. It said you're making yourself dull of discerning, calling good evil, evil good, and it's blocking the yoke-breaking anointing, Isaiah 11, 20, 10, 27, that would make God's, their necks so fat with his power, that no invisible power, invisible power, that no fierce nation could take them over. The Assyrians were trying to take them out and wipe out their culture. But the point is, Adam was given respect, undeserved respect, by Father God after he wrecked the whole creation. Can we not learn and resemble that a bit with our children, with our people we teach, with our relationships? So Isaiah 118 is a big one also. It says there is a model of the Father's heart which would be in the prophet Christ. And it says, come, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet. He will wash them white as snow. So that means God wouldn't jump on somebody, accuse them. He didn't have dross. He would go relate to them. Come, let us reason together as like a dad, a great dad, like father in the garden. Like anybody's respectful. Come, you know, let's talk about it. I want to hear your side because it's the heart. The heart of the Lord in respect, not putting fear on them or the religious rules, word cursing. So we got to translate and teach that in prophets, certain kind. 
when we have all the kinds of prophets that are out there and certain ones met you know there are all sorts of things false authority true authority false doctrine true teaching even occult mesmerizing but also witchcraft you know different things when we have the jezebel spires my per the worst one you know to know for 30 some years that there's a group out there targeting strangers that walk in many times mostly women or atypical persons and that they are predatory aggressive it really character assassinating because they will not speak same thing over and over and over and over and over same pity me fruit poor me fruit it is a doctrine of this that does it in different places around the world and the nation usually where it's we centric colonial training of Levitical patriarchy now I want to say if I read and know my Christ like I'm teaching now do I see that critical spirit do I see that judgmental that haughty I'm gonna read you and never speak to you but I'm gonna know you and cut you know tell everybody about you is that simply is that Jesus no so we go back to the old yes we go back to the old but we're looking for the Lord in the old not the craggy prophet not the grumpy proud you know like get away from me you little peon I'm the prophet which is there in the United States it is there in ministry so I hope everyone you're getting some enlightenment you're getting a new vision you know the days have changed the season is gone people have heard let me say this I'm with the grassroots I'm part of it I love the grassroots I really like it but you hear all these years of the scuttlebutt of the same teaching and media and the same kind of people preaching the same thing and a lot of people like myself we've grown up here in all this fighting all this accusation all this thiefology what is thiefology that's a teaching term the thief Jesus said in the Bible, the thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. Jesus has come that you have life more abundantly. The prophet brings you life, not lying, stealing, and robbing your joy or your your bat, your reputation or your uh, soul, mind, will, and emotions. Because if it's, if it's occult and demonic, it will really oppress you, and it's demonic. Let us begin again to teach the truth about the prophet Jesus and as I said he wasn't a religious spirit he wasn't a lying prophet he didn't if you read Christ in the Matthew Mark Luke and John scenario he wasn't not a toying prophet posturing humorless prophet he did his father a world of good Jesus did he did his father but he had stress and pressure and the fill and the Pharisees didn't like him or the Sadducees or the different ones didn't like him because they were in their system the collection of big boss had arrived and Jesus Christ was a threat because he wouldn't have he wasn't pretty like them he wasn't formal like them he wasn't stayed in their ways like them that you know were the crust mama said my mama said years ago when I was in junior high or high school mama was the pastor's wife teacher but she wasn't the pastor and she was not a prophet but for some reason unknown mom said when in you know, a couple of times after you know a couple of times I don't know why but she would say Tavo out of the blue Tavo, do you realize that when there is a Christian move of ministry and they're all set in place, everybody respects them, everybody accepts them, they're writing their books, all these things are going on, they're accepted as a stat, you know, standard, then God will start another move to come up and expand on it. Right? But because they're threatened, they now have their way, their rules, their neo Phariseeism, they have their style, they're used to it. And it could be big or small. So they're they're not they're threatened by it. She said I, they will accuse it. They'll talk against it. They'll put it down. They'll lie about it. They'll do all these things to block them. However, then finally that newer move gets in place and they set up. They're expected, respected. They're valued. They have their teaching centers. Maybe they'll have their media right now. 
And it said, and she said this, she said, however, when they get in place, another move will come and they'll start to come and they won't recognize them either. And they'll start to go after them saying they're just misfits. They're jealous of us. They're the dysfunctional. They're coming to take our place, undermine our ministry, which is exactly right. I've been through that. So let's learn from that. First, when I researched my Christ, the minister, prophet, was he a turf owner, a people owner, a slave owner? No. Was he into that? Was he into that big boss stuff? No. You can read it for yourself, just in case. All right. But then I say, what is more valuable? People being under your ministry, in submission, haughty like you, or meeting Jesus anywhere before it's too late? That's us. All right. But let's say this. So mom gave that idea. Mom was sent, which was very unusual for mother. All right. What I thought since then in that time, you know, when I grew up and got in ministry, I thought, listen, let's learn from that and not despise and reject and accuse people we've never met. If they have a different flow, a different movement, let's just get everybody ready for that. Okay? And the other part was, I always, I'm very socially, I'm a aware person, I'm very listening for the generations, not my own, I, I, my generation's pretty encased, a lot of it, not all, but anyway, down here, I'm listening all my life, I want to hear what the new crop of leaders coming up is going to say, and I always listen, all right, so let's do that, intergenerational is this, but I'm listening, so the idea goes that we have to be careful how we treat people and respect people that visit that don't look good to you, but have a call for a future church. All right. Next, with that thought, a lot of people in this day are abused. They're derided. They're put down. They're bullied. A lot of people have a lot of hard times in their background. Not their fault. Be very careful. Next. Do you realize that with the principle that my mother stated, that there is a new move now, and I'm part of a new move, and there's a new one, but, but this is only a rough draft. A couple of years, the Lord just, the Lord put in my heart, tell everybody that every move of God, every true move of Christian move of God is just a rough draft for the next. We can handle that. But that principle applies to the babies, the wee babies asleep, the toddlers are the new move. If, if the Lord didn't come. Every new move has something to offer if it's true, big or small. We got to be more careful and safe and not touch God's anointed when they show up not looking like your move or your kind. But I thought, I used to say this from the 80s or the 90s, really. 90s on, I said, you know, let's be careful because there's always a new move asleep in the church nursery. There's always a new move asleep in the church nursery. Now I have to say, if those parents have not quit church because they were driven away, biased away, troubled with the stuff game playing and just quit, now the children are at home somewhere. So we gotta watch it because that is the issue right now. Why can't people go? Why can't I go in certain kind? I'm not complaining, but I'm saying it's realistic. Why can't people go now? and hear God, and fellowship with the saints, Hebrews 10, 25, instead of being spied on, witchcraft, uh, controlled, all these things, that is the game playing of Phariseeism. It really is. So as Jesus Christ did, as Jesus Christ did, well, Father God did it, when it was time to herald and announce Jesus Christ's birth of the new move, where did he go? Where did he send those angels to say, glory be to God in the heavens? You know, where did he send those people? He sent them outside of the system to the shepherds on the hill. The lowly shepherds, probably not as educated, probably all different colors, probably just barely making it because they were shepherds. He sent them to the shepherds. And that's how we should treat and respect everybody. I would point out, I would point out that when you're looking at who's doing what with media, with different famous media and, you know, wannabe famous media, you're going to find the usual patriarchal, 
patriarchal ministry, tongue talking or not, mostly or not, that does it. You're going to find, and I'm not telling you not to, I'm trying to hear God. you got to be very careful. You want to say it firmly. You want to say it right. You don't want to say it like the devil himself accusing because their mamas and daddies might have cursed them out already. You don't know that. But I'm saying when I look at the perspective of people who were historically, since the 70s when I came aware of this, reviling the sinner. And a lot of people lambast the LGBTQVW, whatever that is. They, they were, you know, they were, they lambast that particularly over and over. My thought was, all, when you word curse anybody with legalism, you're just going to make people fed up and not care what you say. Whether it's go to church, you're a church hopper, like I've gotten fed up with that. <laughs> I'm not fed up with people, but I'm fed up with the crapology, the thiefology that's still in my joy to fellowship with the saints. All right. So let's say you teach a principle, everybody. You teach a principle that if Christ confronted Adam with respect and he'd blown the garden and the world and all the planets from here on out, wow, couldn't we have a little charity and be respectful and say it in a tone, a methodology with respect in case and let them hear for themselves? And that could be any kind of sin, any kind of parameter, any kind of faith. The thought comes if Isaiah 118, come let us reason together, is there, and the prophet would do it, Jesus, and we would do it, Isaiah said to do it, come let us reason together, let's talk. And you realize that before that in Genesis, the biggest story that these people want to say over and over and revile people, do you realize the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is before Isaiah 118? We're not trying to see anyone endorse, anyone compromise, anyone go there, but we're just saying, what is there a way to love people, respect people, and encourage them to hear God without the rules or without all the pain, the pain in their back, you know, reactivating the pain of many people before you met them, their backstory. I will not say that as a formula. I would say that it is one by one, time by time, how God tells you, but I'm pointing out some major deals that are affecting the grassroots, that affect me, that affect you, and I have literally had people sent, I'm a sent messenger, had people sent that were from that community through the years, and all I know is they are really funny, they are well thought out, they're very smart, and they have been through it, and they're used to being word cursed, they are used to it. And I think everybody needs to know, there for the grace of God go I. I have dealt with people literally that were assaulted by the priest for the whole time they were in high school. And then when they told their father, who was a big donor up in the north, that that went on in high school, the father did it. So then they went to get away, and they started baking for the HIV people in San Francisco years ago because they were dying and they had heart of compassion. And I'm thinking, uh, where is this? So I am saying we're not monkeying with people. We are not monkeying with people. If you want people to come and worship at your Hebrews 1025 fellowship with the saints, you better be ready and aware that you're not the only one in the world who has ever lived this life. Now, you have my permission, saints, to invite me to speak to you, chat, iron sharpens iron, uh, we're not going to be biased against you, target you, I believe I deal with men and women, I call you humans, see this is it, once you, di once you die a tribe, one subculture of humans, 